know, in the past weeks, you all have been discussing um, rebellious fidelity and really great messages as well as testimonies that have come from several of you here in this congregation. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you're here and you have not checked that out, I would encourage you to do that. I think even in the early church, there's a lot of things that happened because people were sharing their testimonies about what God was doing and people were inspired and encouraged by that. Um, and so, so today, uh, I want to share a message with you. Uh, Sean was like, yeah, we're, we're, we've ended one series, and so we're going to start another series a little bit later, um, so you can just share whatever you feel like you need to share. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> cool. If you follow my Facebook page, you probably got a little preview of this, and as I was initially, it was just going to be just the thought uh, that I shared, but as the days went on, I was it, and more began to come. I felt like, okay, this is this this is a thing here, and it really is about discerning the voice of God, but specifically how to respond when God says no. How to respond when God says no, and there are a lot of myths about that and misconceptions about that. How to respond when God says no. When I uh, stepped down from my role at a church in Fairfield back in 2019 and I uh, felt like the season there had been over and I had uh, a wife and two and a half kids. Uh, one was still in the oven. Um, and the reason why that's important is because I knew that I needed to leave but I didn't know where we were going which is fine if you are solo. It's a little less risky. But when you have a wife and, and children, um, you, you want to have as much certainty as possible, at least some kind of a plan on what's, what's going to happen. If we're going to leave here, then where are we going? What are we going to do? So I didn't have a, a job lined up. I didn't have any of that. And really, all my life, I thought that was an irresponsible thing to do, which led me to stay longer than I should have. Like that's, uh, and the reality is sometimes you, you don't know where you're going, you just know where you can't stay. And you end up staying longer waiting on the next step to be clear. And sometimes it's not going to be clear. You have, taking the step without a step is the step. Does that make sense? Um, sometimes you, you, don't, you don't know. And so you can end up staying longer in a place where God's giving you all kind of indication it's time to go, it's time to go, it's time to go. But well, I don't know where I'm going to go. Yeah, I know, but it's just time to go. You need to step out. Well, step out where? I'll tell you when you get there. That's what he told Abraham. I'll tell you when you get there. Sometimes you don't know where you're going. You just know where you cannot stay. And that has to be enough. But for me, I, I've never had to do that before. Um, there, was, there was always a next step, and, and in, some, in some ways, um, I locked God in to always moving that way. So if I didn't know there was a next step, then God wasn't speaking yet, because the way God moves in my life, <laughs> you ever heard somebody say that? Well, the way God, the way he works, like we have an agreement, we have an arrangement, like, <laughs> I know it's like nine billion other people, but me and God, we're special, <laughs> special. Um, it's like, no, no. But there had been a pattern that I got used to, and I didn't recognize when he was interrupting the pattern, but it was still him. Don't, don't lock him into a pattern, right? So if we're going to talk about how to respond when God says no, we first got to at least mention how to recognize when he's saying no. Like responding to it and obeying it and stepping on in faith when he says no is one thing, but recognizing when he is saying no is really important, especially when you have to also discern if you're meeting some resistance, is it spiritual warfare or is it God saying no? Like this is really important because that's going to de determine how you respond. And sometimes we thought it was warfare. We're praying and sweating and spitting in Jesus' name and all that, and it's the Lord. Now who are you, who are you praying against? Like what's... what's Right, if it's God closing a door, who are you going to pray to open it? Right, so you got to recognize it because it could just be really frustrating. You can waste a whole lot of Facebook posts and global prayer chains. <laughs> J 
just to find out, hey guys, my bad. <laughs> this is the Lord, it's not the devil, it's not the devil. I, uh, I was told he'll just give me whatever I want, and uh, that's not the case. So recognizing that is important. So when, when I, I, I stayed longer than I needed to, and when we finally made this, made this step, not knowing what was going on, I, I, I was gonna step down from being an executive pastor and then uh, look at planning to travel around the country to do, do some church consulting to help just help churches grow. There had been a gift that I discovered about helping bring some organization and clarity to some things. So I thought, okay, we're, I'm gonna step down here and then just do it with more, with more churches. And so it made sense to move closer to Sacramento just, you know, I could just jump to the airport and back instead of having a 45 minute drive. So, so we started looking at houses in near, near the Sacramento area. And, um, and so from Sacramento and Natomas and then all these different, you know, we didn't know much about this area. So we're kind of really trying to research stuff and what, what would be good areas to raise kids and all this kind of stuff. And so, um, and even down to Elk Grove and all this kind of stuff. So here's, here's the, the, the crux of this message, is that when you're trying to look for houses, because all I knew is I, I want to be closer to the airport. That was it. I didn't have any preference for any other area. I mean, I knew you all were here in Roseville, but that wasn't a major deciding factor. <laughs> uh, I wasn't moving to Roseville because I love you guys. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't it, because none of y'all could be paying rent or mortgages. So I wasn't considering you all just want me closer to the airport. So in our, in our search for these different homes, we had to like reserve a showing for, you know, for homes and stuff. And um, at the time we're looking for, for, you know, where we can rent, just pop in there and just get it done. And then maybe a couple years to look at buying and things like that. So looking at all these different places. And so we kept running into these crazy situations. Crazy situations. So we make a reservation, which is weird, because like in Fairfield, you can go to a place, like a property management place, get four or five keys, drive around to four or five houses. See, exactly. Yeah, that was me thinking about how y'all do it out here. I can make a reservation for a showtime, for a rental, that makes no sense. But yeah, we could drive, you, you, you know, scan your ID, make sure you're not crazy, and then you can get all the keys you want, and then just go drive around, come back, we're like, okay, we don't like this, and we like this, and we'll apply for that one, and it's a wrap, like, that's it. Now nah, y'all, right? <laughs> gotta reserve a showing so somebody can be there and all. So it was, the thing is, the reason why that's important is because we couldn't uh, look at multiple houses on one particular day that we, are available to drive up here from Fairfield and look at some stuff. And so when we did drive up on those different occasions, like it was an important deal, like we're, we're trying to figure out, is this gonna be it? So one time we came up and there's a place in, uh, in Elk Grove and we're sitting outside the thing and no one's, no one's there. And so we email, hey, what's, what's going on? Uh, oh, we forgot, um, you, you what? Yeah, we forgot to communicate online like this one is already taken. Okay. All right. So we're driving back home like that's crazy. Like these folks need better communication. You know, do they know how anointed I am? Like, you know, I'm God's child. I've got favor in my life. They shouldn't do me like that. You know, all this stuff. So, so I'm going home. Do we got another? Do we got another one? Right, so we drive out here, baby. This is beautiful. This got this, level, you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, how you get all hyped up about it. You start imagining stuff like this could be the one, and so we get we get there, and there's a gate, right? This particular place is in, it's, it's, it's gated. This house, so we get there, like, okay, where's where's the, the well? Um, uh, so I'm calling. Hey, I'm sorry, I um, I got called to an emergency, so I'm not going to be able to be there for this particular showing. Did, did you have my cell number? Well, yes, but I got, then you should have used it then. That's what sort of happened. You should have used it. Like, are you going to reimburse me for the gas? I came from Fairfield to come out here to look at his house. My apologies. Do you want to reschedule? No, I don't want to reschedule. Not at all. So, these are different cities, right? And so, we, you, you got to go, okay. Like, that's just weird. Right? That's just weird. I don't really sense that it's warfare. This, it, it, I didn't have that feel to it. I just, but I just have a feel like, all right, these are, 
this is not normal, right? This is not just somebody not making it. Like these are doors that are closing. And even in the plans and anticipation of moving in that direction, these doors are closing. I'm sharing those examples with you because you gotta, I, I wanted to give you some examples of what does it look like, right? When, there, when there's a no, and, and you could easily go, well, we'll just try again later. But the, the difference is, because sometimes you do try again later, but the difference is something hits you right here. And you go, this is more than just he forgot. This is more than just there was an emergency. There's more than that. And you pick up on what seems to be a natural circumstance that other folks might see as a natural circumstance, and you recognize it as a spiritual indication. OK? So then we have this place that was out in Roseville. We got all excited again, like, babe, calm down. We don't even know, because the way things are working around here, we don't even. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, just try not to get too emotionally attached. Because y'all women, you know, you know, y'all map a whole thing, right? You've already decorated the thing based on pictures <laughs> online. You know what's, what pictures are going to go when the, you already went to, it's like, come on now. We just, so I'm driving, we get here, and uh, there's other people in there, you know. It looks like they're selling a home. Like, it's, man, how y'all do it? It's weird. So... They was like, well, if you like, you got to be one of the first ones to apply and all this. Well, we liked it. The kids liked it, you know. And so we're getting on the thing and we're, you know, sending our application. Now, we're applying on the way back to Fairfield, like online. Like, we really want to get in this. And so, um, and so then, uh, a day or two later, people come call us and say, you got, you're, you're, you're the one accepted. Your application was accepted. I was like, babe, see, because we were fast. We got in that thing. We were, we were the first ones in the boop, 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 boop. And so they did all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I just wanted to know. So, so we were the first ones to apply. They said no. Which, we were fast, though. We were, we were, we were mobile on the way out. Who, who beat us? Well, there are actually two people that applied um, quicker than you did that got in there, but, but things just didn't work out. And so the, so the owner wanted to, you, you were the. So it wasn't that we were fast, like I earned it. There were two people ahead of us, and it didn't work out. And we got it. Now, where y'all are from, I don't know what you call it. We call that an open door where I'm from. We, we, call, we call that a yes. We call it a yes. So I was like, okay, great. And it just happened to be in Roseville. <laughs> right? So, so um, there's another story I'll share a little bit later on. It's related to this one. But I wanted to kind of give you an indication because as we read this um, story today from the Bible, uh, sometimes we don't always hear and it's not specified when they received a no, what was it like? What, what happened? How did they know that it was a no? How did they recognize that it was a no? Uh, and sometimes the way things are in the Old Testament, very, very dramatic and demonstrative, and you know, when the earth opens up and swallows up somebody, that's an indication. <laughs> like, that was bad. <laughs> do not do that again. That's clear. You, like, you don't need spiritual discernment for that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nowadays, we need more spiritual discernment. So we got to learn, even as a community, we got to learn how do we recognize this stuff when God says no, when God says yes. How do we recognize this stuff when it's just, if it's just my idea and why don't elevate my idea and then call it God's plan because I love it so much? How do we recognize if it's something that we really want to do and if God says it's a no, but the devil says it's a yes and we're looking for confirmation because we have a confirmation bias towards this thing? How do we recognize, even though everything's lining up, something's not right? We have to learn how to recognize when God says something's not right. This is a no. Yeah, and sometimes it will be in a dream, and sometimes it will be in a vision, and sometimes it could be a stranger on the street that mentions something to you that seems natural, but it just, it hits you, right? Like we got to learn how to just go by the spirit, right? It's not just intuition, the spirit speaks to our spirit about stuff, and he can communicate messages to us that could be completely contrary to what we're seeing or what we're feeling. To all of our five physical senses, the spirit can give us an idea or a message contrary to everything that we're sensing, and we have to learn to go with that. No matter what things look like on the outside, we have to learn to go with that. 
That's what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. So when Paul says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. That were their children, they're actually mature children. It takes maturity to learn how to be led by the Spirit of God. And part of that maturity is experiences. And learning from your own experiences, learning from the experiences of others as, as we're sharing things like this, you have, that's how you learn to recognize when the Spirit of God is saying something. I remember when I was in Afghanistan, I was praying. I was like, God, am I supposed to be, when I got orders when I was in Afghanistan. I was stationed at Travis Air Force Base, deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. And before I went, I got orders to go to North Carolina, which means when I come back from Afghanistan, I'm leaving California, going to North Carolina as my next assignment. Okay, but during that, that time, the Air Force was saying, we got way too many people were trying to do a reduction in force. So it's basically military layoffs. And one of the first things they do before they lay off people involuntarily is say, who wants to get out? Like voluntarily, who wants to get out? And I'm like, Lord, what you want to do here? Right, because you know, I'm, I'm Air Force, I'm a captain as an officer, I'm, you know, it, it's like free medical, free dental. Like I ain't, I ain't even heard of a copay till I got out. Right, I go in a hospital for a dental, medical, vision, whatever. I just sign papers, show my ID, give them my last four, and everything is on the government. That's it. Then when I got out, and it was Kaiser, it was like, okay, it's a thirty-dollar copay. What's that? Wait, are you paying? You sharing? Wait, wait. What you mean? Who's who? Who else is? You see somebody else? What you mean copay? Who's paying? <laughs> I don't understand. You know, someone like Lord, I got a nice situation right here. I already got orders to go to North Carolina. I need you to let me know what should I do? Should I get out right now or should I stay in? Should I get out? And here's what's crazy. I went on a fast because it was difficult. It was hard. I went on a fast and um, I went because I wasn't quite sure what the Lord wanted me to do. Here's what I want you to know. Before I came to California, I was in Korea on a one year assignment. The supernatural had been blowing up in Korea as far as demons, that's where I learned about all that stuff, demons and healing and all that. I, I was Baptist before I went there. When I left, I was not. <laughs> all I, look, y'all, stuff was, stuff was happening. And it was like, the stuff of reading the Bible is like happening, and it's like through me, like through my life, through my words, my life. I, it was, it was, I wasn't there, um, but I learned really quick. It was like a crash course. And so I felt like then in Korea, God said, Travis Air Force Base, is gonna be your last assignment in the military. No dream, no nothing, I just, I just, and I was so confident about it that while I was still in Korea, I told them, when I go to Travis Air Force Base, that's my last assignment in the military. I, I was 100%. So I moved to California, Travis Air Force Base, things are going cool and everything, then I deployed to Afghanistan, and now the Air Force is like, hey, we're gonna let some folks go, blah, 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 blah. Now, I got orders to North Carolina. And I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do. All right, here's what's crazy, and I'm about to mess y'all up. So I pray like I'm confused. I pray, I'm going seven days, I'm just gonna drink water, which is a big deal if you're Afghanistan and you're deployed. Like, oh yeah, it's serious. I'm just gonna drink water. So I'm in the dining facility one day, just drinking water, it's a fellowship, and then somebody next, next to me says, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm stationed in North Carolina, blah, blah, blah. North Carolina? Well, I'm praying to decide if I'm supposed to go to North Carolina or not. And they just mentioned North Carolina at another table. That's weird. Then I get to my office in the hospital. I'm looking at the, looking at the news and North Carolina just beat so and so. Oh, North Carolina. That's crazy. Right? And the base specifically was, was Seymour Johnson, North Carolina. Then his chief master sergeant in the Air Force, he, not chief master sergeant of the Air Force, but in the Air Force, he comes to my office, he says, Chaplain, I got a question for you. I, you know, when I leave here, I'm going back home to Seymour Johnson, North Carolina. Like, this is weird. Maybe God's telling me to go to North Carolina. There were seven things that happened that one week about North Carolina, North Carolina. Right? Listen to me carefully. All of those things were external. 
and can be easily manipulated by the enemy. God had already told me. I was already sure. I said, well, this is weird. I'm talking to friends of mine. I'm talking to those who know in the, in the prophetic. Like, what, does, what does this mean? I mean, like this, I'm, I'm, it, was a, it was a tension. It was a tension. I said, you know what? I don't even know. I'm just going to, I'm just going to try to ride out. And if God wants me to get out, he's going to have to kick me out. Well, he had no problem doing that. <laughs> right? So I transitioned out. But it was crazy because the weird thing for me is it seemed like all of these things were confirmations. It seemed like all of these things were confirmations. These random North Carolina, like it, it, was, it was really uncanny. How? Because what I did not know was that the enemy could do stuff like that. Now, I just gave you two different examples of external circumstances where God was closing doors and external circumstances where the enemy was trying to get me to move into something that God clearly told me not to. Where do we, where do we find the truth? How do we know what, what the truth is? It's right in here. Right in here. All the North Carolina stuff caused confusion. Way before there were any options, way before there's all that kind of stuff, God had already told me. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so now let's read uh, some of these, these scriptures here so yeah, some of y'all can feel a little better. <laughs> the reason why this is because this happens to people in the Bible, and you have to know that um, when they hear God or if there's spiritual attacks or whatever, it's not because there's special people in the Bible. This is a story of how God worked through regular people like me and you. you. You can't elevate them to a certain level like they have a certain status with God that you don't have. And so they can experience some things that you can't experience. They can hear some things you can't hear. You can't elevate them that way. They're regular people just like me and you. Right? They're saved, just like me and you. Following Jesus, especially in the New Testament. Following Jesus, just like me and you. But committing to his purpose. Right? So what, part of what we see here is um, in Acts chapter 16, we see the story where the Apostle Paul, who is um, uh, really sent by God to, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Right? He used to be a, um, a Pharisee, which was a religious sect that really persecuted Jesus and really was anti-Jesus. Paul was one of those guys, but he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus going to persecute some more Christians. He encountered Jesus that changed his life, and, um, and then he became, became a, an apostle, one sent by Christ to go and to share the gospel in unreached, unreached places. And all these different journeys, um, Paul encounters quite a bit of stuff that we see recorded in the book of Acts. On his second missionary journey out of three, his second one, Acts 16, Paul's traveling around. This is what it says. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Okay. Now, that's the first indication in this passage of, of the Holy Spirit saying, don't do that. Okay. This is the first time. It's going to be important. There's going to be two. This is the first one. All right. Holy Spirit prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then, coming to the borders of Mycia, they headed north to the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. That's the second no. So instead, they went on through Mycia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave from Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. All right. Now, let's put this map up real quick. I want to give you an idea because if you don't, just all these names and stuff it doesn't always make sense. All right. So, so first of all, um, I'm going to try to stay in the video picture, but the, the red dotted lines are just the geography, separating the geography, okay? We're not really following that. 
But if you look right here from Antioch, you see the arrow going from Antioch up to Phrygia. And from Phrygia, that's where the, the beginning part of what the verse we said, where Paul wanted to go into Asia to the left and the Holy Spirit prevented him, okay? So you see the little black dot line says forbidden to preach, that first one? That was the first like, don't go over there. Here's what's important. Over here you see the, the city of Ephesus, far left, okay? So this no for Paul, don't go over there, was a temporary no. It was a no about timing. So when we read this verse, it says, he says no at that time. That was a temporary, because we, Paul went to Ephesus later on, he, pre he preached in Ephesus, planted a church in Ephesus, we got the book, I mean, the, the, the letter to the Ephesians, Paul had a strong relationship with the Ephesian church, As a matter of fact, that's where, um, where, where Timothy was as well. All right, so he is forbidden to preach there, so he says, so the verse says, we, he went all the way, followed the black arrow, all the way to, right where it says Messiah, right there, he was about to go into Bithynia up north, but that's where, don't go to Bithynia. That's the second no. Okay, now that one was a permanent no. Paul never went over there. So because he got a no there, he went all the way to Troas, and in Troas is where he got the dream, come to Macedonia. And so he would leave Troas and sail off the screen over to Macedonia, which is in Greece. Okay, now here's why that's important. You would think if God says, I want you to take the gospel to where people don't know it, I'm just, I'm sending you as an apostle, I'm sending you as a missionary, then, then everywhere is fair game. The reality is no. It's a no. There are specific instructions, all right? And so when God sends you, you got to go running. You see what I'm saying? You just, you just got to go running. You got to have your eyes focused on the goal, on these crayons and these coloring papers. It's all good. It's all good. Don't worry. She's fine. <laughs> and so, so Paul had his eyes on this, over, this general, but in his mission, he had his own ideas on what he wanted to do. Well, I'm going to go here. God says no. Well, I'm going to go here. God says no. Then he, had, he goes to sleep. He has a dream. And in the dream, come to Macedonia. So he goes to Macedonia. Okay? Now, how did he... Now, in this story, we see that it was a dream that gave him the direction of where to go, but we don't know how he got the nose. We just know that it's clear the Holy Spirit prevented him from going to different places. But it could be really weird to be like, well, if these people don't know the gospel, why would the Holy Spirit tell me not to go over there? We don't know. The, here's the thing. The nose don't always come with a, with a rational answer. We don't know. But what we have to know is that it's a no. And when we, when we get the no, we don't try to rationalize, well, I, I, don't, I don't see why. I, I see all the benefits of going that direction. I mean, the people don't know Jesus. I don't, why would God want? And so when you get the no, don't waste time trying to make the no make sense. Right? Oftentimes in our, I heard you, it's all good. That was funny though. It was funny. All right? It, it, we, in, our, in our culture today, we have this phrase, right? Make it make sense. This is where this is. This is not coming together. Make it make sense. You can't tell God that. Because he's not always going to make it make sense. And you can't delay your obedience trying to figure out why the no is a no. Because timing, timing is very important. And so sometimes we can waste our time trying to figure out, well, why would, because here, here's another aspect of why we, we come to rest with that. Because if God tells us no about something, we have sometimes I have our emotions involved in that thing. And so we take God's no as a personal rejection. God's no is not a personal rejection, right? And if you're processing it that way, it could be harder for you to heed the no if you think it's a personal rejection, right? Even sometimes in our relationships, if someone does not like our idea, we think they don't like us, right? People can disagree with your idea and still love you and accept you. It's, it's, a dis disagreeing with your idea is not disagreeing with you. No, don't, take, don't take the no personally. If I think your idea sucks, it's okay. It's okay. Right? I still love you. We can still go do coffee, but if, if I think the idea is a bad idea, it is what it is. If you think my idea is a bad idea, it is what it is. If the goal is for us to, to make the best solution, then we should be able to have open conversation about what ideas are going to work, what ideas are not going to work, without being so personally invested in it that if you say no to my idea, it's a personal rejection. That's not the case. Not the case. So even when God says no, it's not a personal rejection. 
He doesn't expect you to know everything. That's why he guides us by his spirit. So if, you, if, you, uh, if, if Paul was personally invested in these, in these areas, he probably would have still tried to go over that way and when he, when he found himself into some, some crazy situations. But here's the other thing about that. Here's the other thing about that. So Paul goes to Macedonia. Right? He goes to Macedonia. If you read the, 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 the rest of Acts chapter 16, which I would encourage you to do, there are several things that happen in Macedonia. One, he goes to Macedonia, and the, per, the first person he finds, he, he, there's a bunch of women uh, uh, praying by the river, right? They were Jews, but they're really honoring God, so they didn't know Jesus, but they honored their, 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 their I mean, sorry, they were Greeks honoring the Jewish tradition of serving God, but they didn't know Jesus. And so when Paul went over there and shared the gospel with them, uh, one lady, her name was Lydia, uh, she got saved. She was a, a businesswoman, which was a unique kind of thing um, for her to be as high skill as she was. She was a seller of purple. Poor people didn't wear purple. Rich people wore purple, okay? So she's like had her own like Gucci factory going on there and, and a high level, which meant though that she had some serious money right? And probably a pretty nice house. Well, she gets saved and, and other people in her household get saved. And so she's like, hey, Paul, would you, would you mind staying with us? Like, it would be an honor if you all would stay here at my house. Long story short, this is in the city of Philippi in the region of Macedonia. Philippi, the church is planted in Philippi in Lydia's house. That's the letter to the Philippians. The Philippian church is in Lydia's house which we wouldn't have if Paul went to Bithynia. Yeah. So Paul uh, leads them to Jesus. A church is planted there in Lydia's house with these believers. And when I say a church is planted, I'm not talking about all this. I'm just talking about a bunch of believers meeting together in a home. Yeah. Okay, there was, there was a stage and all that, so don't think that. No, it's just believers meeting together in a home. Really, really simple, but that was a church. So then later, uh, Paul is, is, is preaching, walk around, and there's this girl who is possessed with a particular spirit that is a, a spirit of divination, right? Basically, it's in their, a modern-day psychic in their, in their times. Now, because the servant girl had these quote-unquote psychic abilities, her master made a whole lot of money off of her. Well, this girl was following Paul around and saying, these are men of the Most High God come to preach to you about salvation. It, listen, even though the message was true, the source was wrong. Okay? People all the time talk about the devil. He, he can't even tell the truth. Yes, he can. He can tell the truth about you. But it's the discernment to know that the source of this information is wrong. Y'all look like I should stay there for a while. So Paul got tired. He got really frustrated. He turned and he cast the demon out of this girl. When he cast the demon out of this girl, she lost her special powers, which means the, her master lost his profit. So he got all mad, got other people mad, and all riled up and like, hey, God, this dude is tripping and all kind of stuff. A whole mob uh, 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 encircled around Paul and Silas, and he, they got the, um, uh, the magistrates all involved and end up beating Paul and Silas. All right? Beating Paul and Silas. Now, a side, a side note here, the person writing the book of Acts, his name is Luke, okay? Luke was with Paul and Silas. And when you read this particular story, it says, they, we, we went and we did this. And Paul cast out these demons and the mob came against us and they tried to arrest us and, and get us and they caught Paul and Silas. <laughs> did y'all catch that? Luke was like, not today. <laughs> Luke was up out of there. He was like, and they, and they caught Paul and Silas. <laughs> you ain't catch me, Jack. No. Nah. So, so Paul and Silas end up being beaten with rods in the place God told them to go. In the dungeon, the deepest dungeon, because the, the, the people were like, hey, uh, Mr. Jailer, make sure these folks, make sure these folks do not get out. The jailer was like, I got it. So he puts him in the deepest part of the dungeon. Like, no one gets out and escapes from here. I got it. So Paul and Silas in this dungeon, beaten up. You think they may have questioned, was this God? I mean, I know I had a dream, but is this God? It is God. 
then they begin to sing and pray. And, and as they're singing and praying, other jailer, other, other prisoners are hearing them sing. And then the earthquake hits the, the prison and the earthquake causes the shackles to fall off of Paul and Silas and every prisoner in the jail. The doors, not just of the cell of Paul and Silas, but the, the, the doors of all the cells of all the prisoners open up with this earthquake as they're singing and worshiping God in this prison. And when the jailer who was asleep woke up and saw the doors open, he knew his life was on the line. If prisoners escape on your watch, that's your life. You're going to die. So he drew his sword to kill himself. And Paul said, wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. Though the chains have fallen off, the doors are all open. We are all still here. Don't, don't kill yourself. He's like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? How, why are y'all all still here? Why you, long story short, the jailer ends up getting saved. He ends up hearing the gospel. He gets saved. His whole household gets saved. You know whose church you went to? <laughs> Lydia's. <laughs> so it's like, come to Macedonia. We go to Macedonia. Lydia gets saved. And now we got a house church. Oh, this is great. This is God's will. The demon girl's like, he cast the demons out like deliverance. Yes, this is God's will. Uh oh. Now we get beat up, thrown in a prison, in jail. And this, this ain't no prison where you can get like a college degree and got Wi-Fi. Like, <laughs> this is like prison, like urine and rats and feet and all that. They don't. There's not good sanitation. Like you are in there, a pitch black dark, and and you and you want to get in there and start singing, "How great is our God." And an earthquake happens, like, man, this is just crazy, but he's singing to God. Now the jailer gets saved, like, oh, yes, okay, this is, this is, this is definitely God. Jailer's house gets saved, this is definitely God. There's ups and downs when you follow God's will. There are hard times that are in the plan when you follow God's will. And you cannot see those hard times as a reason to doubt whether or not God sent you to begin with. There are, there, are, there are some hard times that happen. The church began to grow. And when Paul and Silas got out of the jail and um, uh, the, the, they were found to be innocent, all the magistrates were like, hey, Paul and Silas, our bad. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't know that you all were Roman citizens and we should not have done that. It was illegal for us to do that to you without a trial. So our bad. You want a Band-Aid? They leave, they go back to the church in Lydia's house. The challenge we have in responding to God's no is sometimes we think, there are a couple of myths here, sometimes we think it's because we disobeyed God and he's punishing us. No. Sometimes we think that if we wanted to do something and God said no, then there's something wrong with the way that we're thinking. We can be, uh, beat ourselves up. It's like, no, God's plans are big. He just knows what's going on. We see his way more than we, than we can see. Just got to learn to recognize his no. And, and, and the way we can respond well to his no is trying to step back and be a little self-aware. What about my desires wanted this thing? What about my agenda wanted this thing? How can I objectively take a step back and pray and kind of unemotionally invest myself so I can hear what he is saying? Because maybe if I'm honest, this is really my will and not God's will. And sometimes I want my will to turn into God's will. Like, God, you can do anything. Make my will the best one. Make my plan your plan. Let's work together. We are co-laborers. It's like, no, he can see all kinds of things, right? He can, he, can see, he can see that Peter is already in Bithynia. He can see that. He can see all those things. So I want to leave you with a couple, of, a couple of, of, of tips, I would say, if you're trying to figure out, is, is God saying something to me, and if so, um, what is it? And if, if it's a no, how do I accept that it's actually 
that it's actually a no. Um, the one thing I would say to you is that God's spirit is not going to lead you to what you would find most enjoyable or convenient. Right, so stop letting the culture that idolizes happiness cause you to think that happiness is the main ingredient in God's will for your life. Now, sometimes following him, you're running into some really, really hard things that are not gonna feel happy. It's not gonna feel happy, but that doesn't mean that you're out of God's will. So if you take this requirement of happiness <laughs> out of discerning God's will, you, that's one thing that'll help you be a bit more clear, okay? Um, the, there are a lot of p pastors and pulpits and things that are trying to tell you, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy. That's not, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. God's plan and purpose for your life will involve some ups and downs. But here's, here's the thing that I want to um, think about closing with. Um, a lot of folks got no's. Even Jesus got a no. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Like, Father, let this cup pass from me. He asked him three times, and the Father was like, no, this cup can't pass. Because if, if, if you don't die on the cross, then there's no hope for John Harris. <laughs> if, you, if, you don't down the, if you don't shed your blood, then there's no other sacrifice available for John Harris. There's no way he can become a child of God. And you've seen his life, Jesus. He needs us. He needs us. And so Jesus said this, this is what I'll say to you. Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. When you have that posture in your heart where you are surrendering to the will and purpose of God, when your life is committed to the purpose of God, it's not like you can't have a conversation with God and say, God, I'm not feeling this. It's not like you can't have that conversation. Have the conversation. Get it all out. But when you surrender to the will and purpose of God, then you know that there's no other requirement for you. You don't, you don't add any requirement to it. Well, it's got to be this. It's got to be that. No, no, no. It's God's purpose. And I just want to be clear about his purpose and his will. And I might not know the next step, but I know what he said. I might not know what things are going to look like five years from now, but I know what he said. Listen to me carefully. I know what he said about the person I'm currently dating. If this is a yes or a no. I know what he said about the job I'm trying to pursue, if this is a yes or a no. I know what he said about the, the other things I'm trying to pursue in my life for ambition and all the kind, whatever, if this, is, if this is a no. I know what he said about moving. I know what he said about, about whatever else, right? Heed it. Heed it. Behind every one of God's no is a bigger yes to something else. And the no doesn't mean that the thing you had in mind was actually a bad, a, a bad issue, a bad person, or a bad situation, a bad opportunity. It's just not God's best opportunity. That's all. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be bad. You're trying to figure out, well, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? You ever, you ever talk to people like that? Well, what's wrong with it? It's just not God. Well, what's, wrong, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it is God hadn't said yes. That's the only thing that needs to be wrong with it. God said no is what's wrong with it. That, that has to be enough. That has to be enough. And so let's put this last slide up on there for some, some, some tips. So don't try to rationalize God's no. Obey God's no. Check your own emotions and desires. Sometimes you might be more invested than you should be. Um, and remove your agenda. And then pray for faith. Sometimes our resistance to God's no is because we don't have the faith to move into what he's telling us to do. We might not have the faith to wait. We might not have the faith to obey, right? But don't try to turn the no into a yes. Pray for God's faith to obey the no, okay? I thought that was going to be bigger than that when I made that slide. <laughs> it's bigger on my iPad than it is on that slide right there. <laughs> Pray for eyes to see. <laughs> but that's sometimes it's just our doubt. It's not that the no is unclear. We don't like the no. We don't agree with the no. And we're doubting what's going to happen. Pray for the faith to wait and the faith to obey. And then surround you and have the courage to tell somebody around you that God said no, but you're still wrestling with it. So they can hold you accountable to staying with that no. Right? Don't keep God's no a secret because you will sabotage yourself. Tell God's no to other people around you who can say, remember, ah, 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 God said no. 
God said, no, I know, but I just, no, 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 we got to wait. We gotta, let's pray right now because you're, you're, you're about to get weak. You're about to get weak, I, right? So I'm telling you, the community can help you with the no. And if you're still wrestling with it, the community can help you decide, what is this what God said or not? Okay? And talk to people, finally, talk to people who you know, like they've committed their lives to listening to God and hearing God. Right? When you look at their life, there's a record. You okay? Is, she, is she okay? Come, come, come. Okay. She's like, let me go to mommy. Okay. Right? So w- when you look at people's lives, look at people's lives who there's a record of them obeying and hearing the Holy Spirit, right? These might not be your BFFs. When it comes to hearing God, your BFFs are not qualified to hear God just because they're your best friends forever. All right? You want to go to people who have a record of hearing God. And if that's not your partners from way back, in, then don't talk to them. All right? This, this is too serious for you to try to go and talk to people who you know are just going to agree with you no matter what. You don't need that. You need people going to help you hear this is what the Lord is saying or what he's not saying. Okay? All right? That's the qualification. And then over time, you'll learn. You'll learn how to do it. You'll feel it in your spirit. Right? And you'll see the church in Philippi that grows because you heeded the nose. See that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? That's the church in Philippi. Forgetting those things that are behind me, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the church in Philippi. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every time we'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's in the letter to the church in Philippi. We don't always know what's on the other. That's what makes, that's the difference between you and God. We surrender to him and commit to him. We commit to his purpose. When you commit your life to his purpose, not as an option, but you commit your life to living for his purpose, then his purpose becomes more clear. As long as his purpose is, a, is an elective for you, that it's a side dish, it's going to always be confusing. It's going to always be confusing because your own will is first. When God's purpose is the main course, when God's purpose is why you live, then what it is for you, then it's going to be clear and the decisions become more clear because you're looking for his purpose, not convenience, for his purpose, not comfort, for his purpose and his glory, not your own glory, and things become much more clear when you commit to living that way. All right? Now, obviously you know there's more I can say about that, but let's stand so we can go get our kids. I want to invite the prayer team to come up, and if you, if you need prayer today, these folks can help you. Maybe it's responding to what you heard today. Maybe it's getting clarity about a yes or a no, whatever it is. Maybe it's deciding today to follow Jesus for the first time. Whatever it is, the bigger picture for all of us is being led by his spirit. It's a learning process. Right? And if you make a mistake, it's all right. There's grace for our mistakes. He can turn some things around and get us back on track. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. I've made plenty of mistakes in my past, thinking it was God and it wasn't God. It's part of how, it's part of how you learn. But his grace is like a net that catches us. And when we're intending to do his will and we get off, he gets us back on track. And it's okay. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, that brings us into your family. Our faith in him brings us into your family in a whole new way of living. You place him inside of us, your spirit on the inside of us, and you're leading us and guiding us by your spirit so that we aren't moved just by external circumstances. But we can recognize when you're up to something versus when the enemy is up to something. Help us to recognize when it's something, when we're trying to pursue our own selfish desires versus your will. God, we really want to do your will. Help us to recognize it. Help us to hear your voice and recognize your voice, submit to your voice, and follow your lead 
so that your will and your plan for our lives can become a reality and so that we can give glory and honor to you even in ways that we don't even think are possible right now. So I pray for faith. I pray for clarity. I pray for any clouds of confusion that the enemy has brought into our minds and our hearts to be moved away right now in the name of Jesus and for your voice to be clear. We are your children. We can hear you. We can recognize the voice of our shepherd because we are your sheep. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, if you need a prayer, come on up. All right. Appreciate that. God bless you all. Have a great week. We'll see y'all next time.